Go ahead and roll it. I am a professional hoarder. I hoard history and all of the stories that are told through everyday objects. I spend my days at the Museum of the Rockies with fine characters like this, and I preserve and protect the objects that help us all understand our collective past and how that past informs our present. I'd like to start with a number, 260,000, which is the approximate number of cultural history artifacts that are in the museum's collection. Over a quarter of a million individual artifacts, which is a pretty huge collection. But why do we have all of this stuff? How do we decide what goes into a collection? And what does any of that have to do with all of you? You may not know this, but you are so important when it comes to a museum's collection. That's because museums collect and hold objects for all of you. It's an idea that we call the public trust. Public trust means that the museum and the public have an agreement that number one, the objects in a museum are an important cultural inheritance. And number two, that the museum will safeguard that heritage for the public's benefit. Safeguarding can include cataloging, storage, and cleaning, like this half-cleaned feather that you see here, which increases an object's lifespan, utility, and accessibility. So I'm not a true hoarder, because it's not actually my collection, it's all of yours. History museums accomplish the task of fulfilling the public trust by collecting what we call material culture. Material culture is all of the physical objects that people make and use that define our culture. Anything that you can think of, artifact, clothing, furniture, art, photographs, tools, and we use those in exhibits, research, and programs. And that's why people love museums so much, because they're all about you. They're about your stories and your history. They're about helping you make connections that you may not have known even existed. They're about showing you how we as a society grew and changed and evolved. And they're about bringing unrecognized people and stories to light. So how do we decide what to collect? Honestly, it's a mix of attempting to forecast what objects from the past will best, what objects will best explain the past to current and future generations, plus a little bit of Monday morning quarterbacking as we refine collections uh, from years past, and also asking ourselves some tough questions. Most of our collection is donation-based, and we rarely buy artifacts. Instead, we rely on people like you who approach us and offer donations. This set of Yellowstone National Park postcards was offered to the museum from a donor in Missouri whose father had purchased them on a trip to the park in the 1920s or 1930s. When an object is offered for donation, we think about a couple really important questions. First of all, where did this object come from? You see here our Yellowstone National Park bus, uh, which was turned into a tow truck, because we tell stories of people who lived in the Northern Rockies region. This tells stories of tourism and motorization in the park. We also own who ask who owned or used the object, which we call provenance. Provenance helps with exhibit design and research. The more provenance, the better. This honorary doctoral hood was awarded by Montana State to Jeanette Rankin, who was elected from Montana as the first female national representative in the United States. We also consider how the object fits in with the rest of the collection. Do we already have several of that object? Do we need any more? What you see here is a small portion of our teapot collection, so we probably don't need any more teapots. Unless your teapot has really great provenance, like it was John Bozeman's teapot, and then we can talk about it. <laughs> we also ask if we have space to store the proposed donation. Our collection is so large that only about one half of 1% is on exhibit at any given time. So most of our collection does live in storage. If we don't have enough space to store and care for the object, it would be unethical for us to accept it. To give you even more of an idea of the variety of objects we collect, the ways that they intertwine, and the stories that they can illustrate, we're gonna play a little game of six degrees of separation using the museum's collection. And we're gonna link this railroad cap with this sweet pea can. We're gonna visit MSU, Yellowstone, and Big Sky along the way. Our first stop on the magical history tour is this Northern Pacific Railroad Brakeman's Cap, which dates to the early 20th century. Railroad expansion had many impacts on the West, including by increasing tourism to Yellowstone Park as the Northern Pacific reached Livingston in 1882 and Gardner by 1902. 
Around the same time, the Army had taken control of the management of Yellowstone and established Fort Sheridan at Mammoth in 1886, which later became Fort Yellowstone in 1891. This is a 1911 Colt Service pistol, which dates towards the end of the Army's control, which was transferred to the Park Service in 1918. Nowadays, it's not Army forts or railroad lines that brings people to Yellowstone. It's usually recreation. But recreation and recreational technology has changed over time, sometimes really dramatically. I think we can all be glad that our cross-country and downhill skis are no longer made of wood with leather bind strap bindings. We can't talk about skiing without talking about ski areas. This is an Emmy won by Chet Huntley for the Huntley Brinkley Nightly News on NBC. Huntley was born in Cardwell, Montana, and was integral to the development of Big Sky, both the town and the ski area, by helping to secure 11,000 acres for the ski resort. Like many Montanans, Chet attended Montana State, and the museum holds a large collection of MSU-related artifacts, which help us tell stories about the school and the community. This is a senior class sweater, which belonged to another Montanan, Ruby Stanhope, who graduated from Montana State in 1928 with her degree in economics. And Montana State brings us around to our pecan through the research done by the Agricultural Experiment Station, which introduced sweet pea farming to the area in the early 20th century. Canned pea production became one of the primary economic drivers of the town from 1916 to 1958. These are just a few of the many wonderful, rich stories that we hold for you on shelves, in boxes, and on exhibit at the Museum of the Rockies. If these shoes could talk, I'm sure they'd have some stories of their own, especially those platforms. And who knows, one of you out there might have the next great story and object that belongs in a museum. Thank you.